During a campaign of mine, the party descended far below the town of Omar in the Sea Kingdom of Gan. Entering an ancient complex whose original purpose was forever lost to time, they encountered crystals that spoke with an unusual sense of personality, locks on doors that took on the form of serpents made of glass, a room where the last of a dying species locked in stasis reached its final evolutionary stage, a corridor of grasping hands, and an automaton that would come to stalk the party as they traversed the Ninth World. But before any of this was cracked open, the party had to deal with some hostile entities. Descending down an impossibly long ladder into this ancient complex, vicious mechanical creatures followed them down on strands of light, and combat ensued as the party reached the bottom of the ladder and made a run for an ancient trolley system that would take them further into the complex. This was combat in motion, and not once did I ask for an initiative role. This was about the narrative tone of conflict, of danger, and not the mechanical structure of who is standing where and who does what when. At the time, I was trying out somewhat of an experiment. How long can I continue to describe or create a dangerous situation until the players recognize we're entering combat and then ask for an initiative roll? In this scenario, they never did ask to roll for initiative. Instead, what followed was a continuing description of the ancient depths they were traversing. The mechanical creatures were a facet of this place, and the interaction with them, which involved combat maneuvers, felt as seamless and natural as a few rounds of roleplay with NPCs in a town square. The combat, the danger, the chaos of watching one of these mechanical beings regenerate itself from a GM intrusion after a portion of its legs were cut off and entered the trolley they were escaping on, forcing players to engage in close quarters combat with this mechanical monstrosity, all of it was intended to evolve seamlessly without a sudden announcement of combat. And everything felt rather fluid. There was no ringing of the roll for initiative bell. It was just a story that flowed from one sequence to another, and it helped focus my personal goal of finding efficient and narrative-focused means of framing combat in dangerous scenarios that didn't remind the players that they were playing a game by stopping the action to ask for initiative roles. Initiative and how we move a game into its more mechanical functions like combat has been an ongoing topic of interest of mine, and here in this video I'm going to discuss some perspectives on tracking initiative and framing combat scenarios in Numenera and Cypher System games. As with all discussions about mechanics and rules on this channel, it is best practice to understand that this video involves interpretations of the written rules. Some elements of this video might stray close to house rules, but I'll do my best in highlighting the differences between what the book says and how I handle rule calls at my table. I have long been an admirer of Gears of War. The original left a strong impression on me back in the 2000s, and while the third-person shooter genre of video games has evolved beyond much of what's in the game, it provided a solid foundation that continues to influence video games to this day. Its preference for placing the player into combat scenarios, however, is of particular note when we're talking about the structures of combat and encounters, especially in a tabletop role-playing game. One of the first areas of interest is in how Gears of War communicates to its players that combat is about to happen. If you haven't played Gears of War, the structure is very simple to understand, and it mirrors what we often see in classic dungeon crawls from TTRPG modules. In Gears of War, the player is generally moving from zone to zone, fighting new groups of enemies each time, occasionally mixing things up with some dialogue, storytelling, and a few branching paths. There's a lot of base foundational ideas in this video game for structuring out the skeleton of a campaign and paying attention to how a game progresses over time, but the game community communicates the expectation of imminent combat in a way that is unmistakable, if not a bit repetitive. It's not long before the player understands that seeing a room filled with waist-high walls and the sound of a literal ringing gong, followed by the emergence of a hole in the ground, that they instinctively smash the button to slide Marcus Phoenix into cover with the same sense of routine that many players grab a d20 to roll for initiative when a creature clearly indicated as an enemy type shows up in the narrative. In critiquing this structure, it's fair to say that, for Gears of War at least, this repetitive pattern is just a part of the game. It's a part of the structure we enjoy. And we can say the same about traditional modes of entering a concretely defined encounter in an RPG, transitioning from perhaps an exploration or a roleplay mode, as it might be called in some games, to an encounter by means of calling for initiative to track who does what, 
when. While we may, from time to time, enjoy the thrill of knowing a fight is about to break out, if we do this every time there's an encounter, that thrill can be diminished. So even if we enjoy the thunderous call to roll for initiative, having different ways to transition into combat can help those drum roll moments when everyone around the table grabs a d20 stand out and feel even more epic. For some, including myself, I find that while useful for framing what a session of a game might look like from a bird's eye perspective, I try to avoid signaling to my players that a room, location, or even character will guarantee combat on impulse. And the quickest way to break that is to ask someone to roll for initiative. It immediately creates a boundary everyone must move through, and in that we risk losing the tone, themes, and feel of the story when we switch into encounter mode in our brains at the Pavlovian ringing of a call to roll for initiative. And while there's definitely a lot to say about how we describe potential or inherent danger, my first approach is to try and avoid the routine of the kind we see in Gears of War, of loudly announcing to the player that combat is about to happen. And the first step is to start tweaking how we enter that combat. And that requires cracking initiative open. As we would likely change the layout of a map in Gears of War or its audio cues if we wanted it to feel less like a pattern of intentional design with a specific purpose and expectation for player behavior, so too can we remove the impulse for GMs to ask for an initiative role at the first sign of conflict, and instead find new ways of structuring how we get into a turn order in Numenera. The first approach in restructuring how we handle combat and initiative is to be proactive in calling for initiative roles. This means going around the table for roles before the players enter a dangerous space, or even at the beginning of the session. This should be done several rounds before the first sword is drawn. In fact, asking for initiative roles at the beginning of a session, leaving the door open to future initiative roles if a player wants to improve their odds of going sooner, is a great way to have an orderly sequence of character actions for an entire game session. It also means that any creature, NPC, or actionable item or event that has a level in the Cypher system already reveals what the order of turns will be expected to be for that encounter. By doing this, you're already figuring out where some of your plans already slot into the turn order many, many rounds ahead of time. Does an NPC speak before or after the players? If their level results in a higher target number than anyone got at their initiative role at the start of the session, then the NPC speaks first. If not, the players are quicker to introducing themselves. You can stick to this as strictly as you'd like. Maybe those proactive initiative roles only make a difference when fists and blades start flying, or maybe they allow you to have some order to the chaos of a party bursting into a room only for everyone to ask to roll perception and look for traps. You, as the GM, by calling for a proactive initiative role very early on, now have an order to sort your players and NPCs that can be followed as strictly as you and the players feel is necessary. This, by the way, is at the heart of why GMs don't roll dice in the Cypher system. It's to free up the GM's responsibilities to address other structures of the game, and since they have such a dramatically different role during a game, it makes sense to structure the rules in a way that frees up the GM to focus on who is doing what, where, and what other characters and events are involved. Proactive initiative also helps us avoid the Gears of War problem of repetition, of signaling to the players that combat is about to happen. Again, sometimes that signaling, that knowledge that a fight is about to go down, is narratively interesting. It is a part of the theater of that game, but sometimes playing with expectation, or saving those predictable moments for where expectation meets an exciting narrative payoff, can help keep a game or series of games fresh and unique. It means that when you want those moments of calling for initiative before a big anticipated fight, the ringing of the initiative bell is heard loud and clear. Otherwise, the proactive initiative order gives you a means of transitioning into a combat scene fluidly. But when something so dramatic happens in the game that the turn order we established proactively hours ago has to be reconsidered, well, then we know we've moved into a different phase of the story. The concept of passive perception, of taking a 10 in other games, has been a rule and practice for some time. An approach I often take when running D&D is to add 10 to everyone's initiative modifier and then keep a record of that series of numbers private. 
For me, that is the passive initiative order, and unless someone wishes to act at a specific moment, it is the order in which I check in with each player as I go around the table and ask them what they want to do in a certain scene. Numenera and the Cypher system don't have initiative modifiers to add onto die rolls, so if you wish to have some means of comparing who is inherently a bit faster than someone else, that's entirely up to you and your group in terms of how simple or intricate it can be. The book even suggests this, saying that the order in which characters act usually isn't important. If the players want to go in a precise order, they can act in initiative order, go around the table, go oldest to youngest, and so on. The adjustments to how we decide who goes first falls into that and so on category mentioned in the book. It's one of the many examples in cipher system books where the rules don't always have a finely tied up point and you as the player or GM are free to brainstorm your own approaches suitable for your table. One of which could be to just add 10 to everyone's speed edge, take those numbers and use that for the turn order. You could list everyone's speed pool in order. You can look at their available skills, abilities, or assets to break time or determine who would likely go before someone else. You could base it on the narrative feel of each character and their personality. So long as you come up with a very direct and clear way to establish an initiative order that is always on in the same way passive perception is in Dungeons & Dragons, this is a great way to, much like proactive initiative roles, have a list that avoids calling for initiative when you don't have to while keeping things moving in a structured order that helps to avoid players stepping over one another with their desired actions, always leaving the door open to taking an active initiative order should the players desire it, giving them the agency to call for initiative when they want it. Which leads us to our next method. Another approach I sometimes take is to communicate to my players that I as the GM will not call for initiative roles and will instead allow the narrative to manifest however it does. This is actually my favorite approach as it can be a little bit more unpredictable and exciting. The goal here is to allow, say, a scene where an NPC and PC are having a conversation that turns sour and leads to someone throwing a fist. By allowing the player to signal to me, the GM, when they wish to have an initiative order, I will just choose to flow with the narrative, as might the player. If the NPC throws the first punch, so be it. If the player, like Han Solo, beats me to it, then this is the story that has happened, and if the players decide that moving forward would be best handled in a strict turn order, then they get to be the ones who make that call for initiative. The other thing you can do with this is, if an NPC strikes first, Treat the player's speed defense roll to dodge or block as their initiative roll since they're both pulling from the same speed stat. It can even transform a deft dodge of an attack into getting the upper hand by having the chance to act first. If a player is thinking about rolling for initiative, then it probably isn't so much of a narrative breaking moment to call for initiative. But by leaving the call to roll for initiative out of the GM's hands and instead choosing to allow narrative developments to happen as they naturally flow, we can remain engaged with the characters, the story, the nature of why there's conflict in the first place, and granting the players the agency to call for initiative on their own terms allows them a choice of how they wish to move forward with a scene or how they wish to interact with the game. A conflict during a session can now flow seamlessly, only with the task rolls or checks that are immediately necessary. We don't have to zoom out to think about turn order unless we actually want that to be a part of the game. Initiative and turn order might not always be the first thing on someone's mind when they start considering tweaks or house rules, but by examining how we enter combat phases in our games and being willing to adjust and experiment a bit, we can gain some greater insight and control into the ebb and flow of an average session, making the most out of this to build better structures for better games. If you found this video helpful or interesting, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to The Infinite Construct for more Numenera, Cypher System, and Science Fantasy gaming content.